So I've owned the A6700 now for a couple of months or so, and I thought it would be useful for you guys just to hear my thoughts on it. For anyone out there that's looking to buy it, for anyone that's looking to upgrade to it, whatever, you know, whatever your situation might be, I thought that this would come in handy and that by the end of the video, hopefully it would steer you into making the right decision. I'm going to separate the video down into a few little various chapters, which I'm going to show now. So, you know, if you're more interested in a certain topic, you can jump straight to that or by all means stick and watch the whole thing all the way through, however much time you've got on your hands, really. Just a little bit of background on me before we get into it. For those of you that maybe aren't familiar with the channel, if it's your first time stopping by, I've been shooting with the Sony APS-C line of cameras for about the last five years. I started off with the A6500 in 2018, I think. A couple of years later, I got the A6600 or a few years later, and now I've obviously just recently upgraded to the A6700. I use these cameras with the Sigma Prime lenses. That's what a lot of my channel is geared around. So if this is a system that you're looking to get into, I do a lot of tests with all those kind of lenses and stuff. So hopefully there'll be a fair few videos here that will come in useful for you. In the time that I've owned these cameras, I generally use them for, you know, like I'm an enthusiastic hobbyist. I use them just to take photos and videos for like my own purposes, but then I also do the odd paid gig here and there. So I do use them for some professional work, but I, it's not like I'm a full-time photographer or videographer, just so we all know where we are. Some of those gigs have included headshots, product photography for an alloy wheel company, content creation for that wheel company, some cool 360 videos as well, as well as a little interview that I also shot on this little camera system. Okay, so part one, which is probably the main reason that I bought the camera, is for the video features. I was so close to picking up the FX30, but that camera really is just geared for video and not for photo. And I didn't really fancy having two cameras, so I kind of kept umming and ahhing about it. When obviously the A6700 was released and I found out that it had video features that were very similar to the FX30 in fact and it's got a few features that the FX30 hasn't, it was a bit of a no-brainer to pick it up. I can now film in 4K 100 frames a second. If you're in different parts of the world, if you're not on PAL and you're on NTSC, you're going to be able to film in 120 frames per second, you lucky little devils. I also get to film in 10-bit, which is going to help smooth out any gradients in skies and stuff like that. And I also get improved image state stabilization, which I believe is the active stabilization. I think the FX30 has one sort of step better stabilization, might be the dynamic stabilization, but this one's pretty good now. I've tested it out a little bit. It's not perfect, but it's certainly a lot better than what was in the A6600. The only negative here is that the 4K 100 frames a second does have a bit of a heavy crop, which, you know, I can live with. It's certainly a whole lot better than the 100 frames a second in 1080p that I used to get in the 6600, which for some reason, and it, I think it's still actually a problem in this camera, is that the 1080 is pretty garbage. But now at least I can live with that crop factor. I've got nice, sharp 4K, 100 frames a second footage. Oh, and the autofocus is also incredible. I mean, it was great on the previous model, but now I believe they've updated the amount of phase detection points. It's got the AI autofocus processor, which I believe has been nicked from one of the newer full frame Sony cameras. So it now will not only track someone's face, but if they start turning away, it will track the back of their head and stuff as well to, to keep them in focus all the time. So yeah, the AF is, is super impressive. Moving on to part two and the photo side of improvements. This is where it's a little bit less mind blowing, I guess, to previous models. I mean, there's more megapixels, which is kind of great, I guess, you know, I'll take that. We've got a physically larger image, so it's quite handy for in case we want to crop into images. As I mentioned in the video bit, the autofocus has also improved here as well. It also works better in lower light, which is quite handy for, you know, sometimes I do little portrait shoots in the garage and I don't always have like a modeling light as such. So if it can lock onto eye autofocus a bit better in low light, that really helps me out specifically. I think it's supposed to have better color science with the new sensor that it's got. I don't really know, I've not overly noticed any big huge differences to the previous model. And in all honesty, you know, like if you're looking to just use this camera predominantly for photography, there's a question there as to whether it's worth the upgrade, to be honest. I personally think you're probably going to take photos on the 6600, the A6400, 
some of the other cheaper models in the Sony APS-C line and you're going to be just as happy with the results. I don't think you're going to notice huge differences to be honest. But that being said, I'll still happily take those improvements. Moving on to part three, which I guess we can kind of say is like improvements to like the ergonomics as opposed to like the bits going on inside the camera, more so the bits that are going on outside the camera, which to list a few, we've got the swivel monitor now, which comes in super handy. It's going to be really good for vlogging. We've got the improved top dial, which is actually quite handy compared to the older model because we've now got almost like a little sub top dial with photo, video and S and Q mode. And within each of those modes, you can then store sort of three memory settings for each, which is super handy because like, for instance, you know, in the video setting, I've got number one is set to 25 frames per second. Number two is set to 50 frames a second. Number three is set to 100 frames a second. So I can very quickly chop between those three modes when I'm out and about shooting run and gun type stuff. It's also lovely to have a front dial on the camera now as well, especially where I shoot in manual quite a lot. I've now got a dial on the back there where I can be adjusting aperture and a dial on the front for shut speed. Well, that's how I've programmed them anyway. I've, you know, you can program them however you want to work them. But that I found has come in super handy. Also, generally the positioning of the buttons is a bit better as well. You know, I don't know if you've had any of these cameras in the previous editions, the start recording button was always in this real like precarious position right on the corner of the camera. But they've now just moved that onto the top of the camera, which just makes much more sense. It's far easier to get to. Finally, the menu system, which has been inherited from some of the, the more top tier Sony cameras is far easier to use. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I kind of got used to the old one that was on the old Sony cameras. They were kind of notorious for being pretty fiddly to navigate your way through. So it's nice now that we've got this new menu system, which also can be navigated via the touchscreen, which again is, is quite a nice improvement a fairly substantial improvement to the camera as well. Part four, which I'm gonna call the Sigma Prime Lens freezing issue, which I thought I'd add in here because I've had a few people message me about this issue, but I'll keep this short and sweet. I've not experienced any of these issues. I'll just let you know what I've got going on with my kit here. I've upgraded the firmware on the camera I haven't upgraded any firmware on the lenses. Tell a lie, I did upgrade the firmware on the Sigma 30mm years ago. I think it made improvements to the autofocus. I've not updated the firmware on any of them for years. So I don't know maybe if that could be an issue if there have been firmware releases for the lenses and maybe that's what's causing the problem because mine haven't been updated and touch wood, I've not been having any of these problems. Part five, which I think is probably quite a popular point of discussion with this camera, is the overheating issue. As much as I had no real desire to let my camera sit there and run tests and let it start melting, I did it for you. I'm gonna throw up the results from the tests on the screen now. I ran two tests, one at 25 frames per second, one at 100 frames per second. In both instances, the camera was on a mini tripod. I had the monitor swiveled out. I was shooting at 4K 10-bit 422 S-Log3. Oh, and the room was at 18 degrees. And I'm pleased to report that I had no overheating issues. In both tests, the cameras ran down until there was no more space left on the cards. On the 25 frame per second test, there was still 60% of battery left. And on the 100 frames per second test, there was still 73% of battery left. And just to confirm, I didn't even have a warning come up. So they literally just ran out of space. It's worth noting that the camera was warm to the touch, but nothing too bad to be honest. I've heard people say that it's like real roasting hot. It, it wasn't anything like that, it was just warm. I will say, just to add on to this though, when I took the camera to Brands Hatch and was doing a bit of filming and photos and all that kind of stuff, I did at that point, I didn't see any warnings, but the camera got hotter there and I believe the temperature on the day was 24 degrees. So I do believe that the ambient temperature is probably gonna make quite a big difference. I don't know, I mean, I can only go by the test that I've done here. I'm in the UK, it's generally pretty cooler here, to be honest. Being in hotter climates could be an issue. I know that there's plenty more tests online. You've probably been watching them all, so you'll, you'll just have to make a, a call there. Part six, which is the A6700 versus going full frame. I guess you can say that I'm very much team APS-C because that's what I've started out with. I've always been happy with it. It's crossed my mind to move over to full frame. But here's my thoughts really is that, you know, I am happy with the quality of footage and photos that come out of these cameras. I understand, of course, that there's advantages to going full frame, but personally for me, it 
it'd be a bit of an overspend for no reason, to be honest. I don't wanna go and spend out, not only on a full frame camera, I also don't wanna have to invest in a whole other ecosystem of lenses as well, which are bigger, heavier, more expensive. You know, this kit I can get around with nice and mobile. None of my clients that I ever do bits of work for ever moan about the quality that I'm delivering. So, you know, I don't wanna go too in depth into a APS-C versus full frame debate, but just for my purposes, as like, a, like I was saying, like an enthusiastic hobbyist, this camera system is perfect. I've got no real need to move up to full frame. I also don't particularly want huge image files either. I understand again the benefits of having big image files, you can crop them down and stuff and still get a fairly high resolution image. But my computer fills up with space quick enough as it is. I don't really need even bigger image files for no real benefit to my workflow. So, you know, that, that's that's a, I guess a, a debate for another time, but that's my that's my viewpoint on it. Moving on to part seven and what are the cons with the camera? For me, there's only a couple to be honest, one of which being that crop in the 4K 100 frames per second. That's a bit annoying, I wish it didn't do that, but you know, I'll take it as a compromise. And secondly, the battery does perform slightly worse than what it did in the A6600. Even though they're the same battery, I just think where this has got a bit more processing power going on within the camera, I guess that's probably what's burning through the battery a little bit quicker. Nothing too significant, but you know, it's just, it's just worth noting that it's not quite as good as what it was on the previous model. I think that's about it. Moving on to part eight and my buying advice, my final thoughts, I guess you'd say, on the A6700. In short, I think it's an amazing little camera. It's gonna be fantastic for content creators out there, aspiring photographers, videographers, filmmakers. For anyone that's already got one of the older Sony APS-C cameras, I think, especially if you're sort of into the videography side of things, it's an exceptional upgrade. It's definitely worth making. If you're solely into photography, I think the upgrades are less noticeable there, you know? I think you're still gonna be happy with like a 6400, a 6600, because they're probably gonna be coming down in price now as well. So I'd be less inclined if I was more photo-centric as opposed to video-centric. But yeah, I found it quite a big jump up to the 6600 for my uses personally. But here's the rub. Here's where I absolutely would not buy this camera. If I was having to go and shoot weddings, events, long form content interviews on a regular basis, especially in perhaps a slightly warmer climate than what we get here in the UK, I would not be opting for this camera as my A camera. Possibly a B camera, but certainly not as an A camera. You know, if there was even a remote chance that halfway through filming someone's wedding, this thing was gonna start overheating and stop recording, that would be enough to put me off on its own. I think if you're looking to go that way with your work, you've definitely got to be looking at the Sony FX30 instead. That's got a built-in fan, you're not gonna get those kind of problems. You don't want the stress of constantly having on your mind whether this is gonna overheat or not. If however, like I said, you're a bit more of a casual hybrid shooter, you want something that's gonna deliver amazing video, brilliant photographs, then I think this, this is the camera to go for. I know that there's probably other cameras out there on the market, so I can't speak for all of them. I've not tested all of them, but I've always been happy in this Sony line of cameras, especially with the Sigma Prime lenses that accompany it, which again, like I said, I've got a few videos about those you can go and check out. But yeah, I'm really happy with the camera. Couldn't be happier. I'm gonna sell off my old A6500. I'm gonna keep my 6600 as kind of my B camera. And yeah, I'm gonna kind of stop waffling now and hopefully, fingers crossed, this video has come in useful for anyone out there that's looking to get into this camera system. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do think about liking and subscribing. If you'd like to support the channel, I've got some presets and LUTs and stuff that I sell that I'll leave a link to down in the description. It really helps to support the channel. But yeah, other than that, I will see you again in the next one. Cheers.